probably <clears throat> most famous gospel stories is the one we just heard. And I think it, it's because we can relate, at least in some way, to that story. And when Jesus told that parable, it was the third in a row in chapter 15 of Luke's Gospel. And it only appears in Luke's Gospel. We won't find it in the other three. But the first, the first parable is about the lost sheep and how the shepherd leaves 99 to go look for the one that's lost. And then the next one is about the lost coin and how the woman turns her house upside down until she finds the coin that was lost and then she throws a big party. Now for those two parables, the people who were listening were going, this guy doesn't know anything about sheep because if he did, he'd understand that that you wouldn't leave 99 to go after one that was lost because by the time you got back, the 99 would be scattered everywhere. <clears throat> or why would you throw a party after finding a silver coin, even if it was very important or you know was, was valuable in itself? You probably spent more than the coin was worth to throw the party that you found it. And besides, it's a little extreme to find something that you've lost and go crazy over. But that was Jesus' point. That God does what human beings would judge to be extreme, maybe ridiculous, even stupid, from a human point of view, to go after whatever sinner that is lost. And similarly in the story of the prodigal son, the son is a disgrace to the family. <clears throat> he has insulted his father by asking for his inheritance already, basically saying to his father, well, since you haven't died yet and I want to go somewhere, give me what I would get if you were dead. And so that was a disgraceful act. So Jesus' listeners would have, you know, immediately perked up on that one. And so we know how the story goes. So here is the son who has been, a, who was a disgrace to the family, who has insulted the father deeply, and then comes back with his tail between his legs, with his speech all prepared, because he figured that he could use his words to somehow or other convince the father to act, at least let him come back and live there. But the father sees through all of that, and in fact it doesn't matter to him, because what matters to him was his love for his son. And that's why he goes overboard. And Jesus' listeners would have thought that the father was just out of his mind. <clears throat> that he, if anything, he should have punished the kid, not thrown a party for him. That's why the, young, the older brother <clears throat> is sort of the representative of reason, in quotes here. You know, here he is the great one from the family who comes back having devoured the property with <clears throat> prostitutes and God knows what else, lived like a, like a slob, was you know, defiled by being among pigs of all things. <clears throat> and yet here he is getting the party of his life. So the people would have thought the father had kind of lost it. But again, Jesus is making that point that yes, indeed, the father in the story went way overboard. But it was his love that was more important, excuse me, his love was more important than justice. His love was more important than anything else, reputation, 
what have you. His love mattered more than even the, that portion of the inheritance that now was gone. And he loved his son enough not to lay any conditions on him, but to embrace him and rejoice that he was alive, that he was well, and that hopefully he had learned something from this whole experience. This God of ours does so often reach out to people and situations and places that we wouldn't think God should reach out to. How God reaches out to the people on the fringes. That's, what the, that's why Jesus was dis, disrespected so much by his own Peers, because he went to the sinners. He went to the tax collectors. He went to the prostitutes. He went to all the people who were not seen as the good people to bring them the good news and to let them know that even though they were sinners, wasn't denying that they had placed themselves maybe outside of the boundaries of the love of God, by the choices that they made, but he was reminding them that they may have thought they were outside the boundaries, and that's why they stayed away from polite company, stayed away from the synagogue, stayed away from the Pharisees, the scribes, and all those other, you know, quote unquote, good people. But he went to them first because they're the ones that needed the good news more than anybody else. The good news that no matter what they had done, they were still children of God. They were still an object of God's love and affection. And that He Himself was the embodiment of that. Coming to them, welcoming them back into a relationship that they had either forsaken or they had been chased away from. And so that they could have that relationship. They could be like the son in the story, welcomed back by the father, or be like the lost sheep or the lost coin that God would go the extra distance for. And so the idea that the apostles and the disciples and the scribes and the Pharisees were supposed to get from this telling and that we're supposed to grasp from it too, is twofold. Number one, we don't go about our lives and living our Christian faith trying to rack up brownie points with God so that if we really mess up, then we can cash in at some point. The point of the matter is that God's love for us is real. God's love for us is consistent. God's love for us calls us to grow, calls us to change, but does not condemn us. Does not make it impossible for us ever to come back. And then if we do that in our lives towards others, if the love that we have for them is that real and accepting, even though it invites change, Jesus didn't tell any sinner that they could just stay the same way they were. And that's one of the reasons why we confess our sins. Because we hopefully come to the realization that even though we are not uh, the worst of sinners, that we still have need for the forgiveness and the embrace of the Father who forgives us because of what the Son has done for us and what the Holy Spirit continues to nurture in us, that we are then called to practice that same kind of merciful, uh, compassionate love towards the people who are around us. It's not an easy thing all the time to do. Sometimes we don't get it quite right. We don't know what we ought to do. 
Should we demand more? Should we be more corrective? Should we be slower about bestowing the forgiveness? Because of the, what the lesson might that have to be learned by that grandchild or, or by even somebody in our own immediate family. We don't know always what the right thing to do is. But what we do know is this, that if it weren't for our Lord, none of us would be here today. And certainly none of us would have any hope that anything from our past or even in our present or what we might end up doing in the future would keep us out of the kingdom of God and allow us to be among the condemned because of what Christ has done, what he continues to do, and how he appeals to us to extend that same loving compassion and acceptance and forgiveness into the world that we live in, instead of promoting division and hatred and despair as so often we fall into. It's a good thing to be reminded that we have reason always to have hope and to trust that the one who is, makes intercession for us, the one who introduced the ministry of reconciliation <clears throat> continues to call you and me back again and again and again so that we then in turn can reach out and call others back into relationship with Christ, into relationship with us. So in this Holy Eucharist today, the, the Lord himself invites us all to his table, not because we're perfect, but because we need that encounter with the living Lord to be strengthened in our faith, to have our hope renewed, and especially to know the power of the love of God that comes to us in Jesus Christ our Lord, to know the bread of life, not a passing manna, but the real deal that we talk about in the first, in the column for today. So we thank the Lord for loving, for loving us faithfully, for loving us into life and keeping us alive in that love, and for that forgiveness that is extended even when we think maybe we're not worthy of it.